Good afternoon. Thanks. Today, <laughs> we have the great honor to welcome Professor John O'Connell. Professor O'Connell is Professor Emeritus at the University of Virginia and is currently a research scholar in residence at the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. As a faculty member for 47 years at the University of Florida and the University of Virginia, his research and teaching focus on thermodynamics, properties modeling, and molecular theory for chemical process design and simulation. Professor O'Connell co-authored six books, including Papyrus, Calculations for multi components vapor liquid and liquid liquid equilibria, properties of gases and liquid, fifth edition, and thermodynamics, fundamentals and for applications. He earned a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He was chair of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers from 2004 to 2014 and served on the ICHD board of directors from 2015 to 2017. Professor O'Connell has twice shared the Cochrane Award for Best Paper in Chemical Engineering Education and was part of the team to win the International Fluid Property Simulation Challenge in 2006. He was also an editor of the journal Fluid Phase Equilibrium from 2004 to 2016. Professor O'Connell has over 200 publications between international journals and conference papers, which to date have been cited more than 7,000 times. So again, welcome Professor O'Connell, we are very pleased to have you here, and now the stage is all yours, all by virtual, given the current circumstances. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Let me, uh, let me point out that that address there is obsolete. Um, it says Charlottesville, Virginia, which I was there for 25 years, but now you can see in my background that I'm in California in San, near San Luis Obispo. So uh, I, I can give you my current address should you wanna communicate with me. But anyhow, let me start by sharing my screen. As, and my connection is now with the California State Polytechnic University in San Luis Obispo. So what's my message? Well, contemporary chemical engineering uses many tools, especially modeling to treat challenging design and analysis situations. These tools have been developed from improved technology for measuring and calculating as well as better understanding of fundamentals and connections among natural phenomena, especially at the molecular level. And I might point out that my hosts in Rio are, have been very important in doing the developing these. But the objective of this lecture is to show how the properties work should take advantage of all the tools that are available by applying them in their proper roles. So let's start with the question of why do we do properties modeling? Well, competitive manufacturing requires that you're going to have new or replacement processes and products as things develop. And it also means that you have to be efficient in the use of your time, your effort, and your investment. We use process simulators now. You know, when I was young, uh, the, we didn't even know anything about process simulators. They were just beginning in the 1970s and came along in the 80s, but now everybody uses them. And the joy of them is that you can do maximum exploration and optimization, but you solve the equipment that's going to be used in a process with process models that use constraint equations of material energy and fugacity. For example, these come from uh, the laws of thermodynamics. And there are thermodynamic variables, which I call conceptuals, enthalpy, fugacity, Gibbs energy differences, and so forth. And conceptuals are not real, they're not measurable, because you have to relate those conceptuals to measurables like temperature, pressure, and composition. So this is kind of the diagram that Rafiq Ghani and I established many years ago about how process simulators uh, use process models based on balance equations and constraint equations. You start with measurable variables, temperature, pressure, composition, number of moles, what species you have. 
and they put those into constitutive equations, which are the connections that go. And then the constitutive equations arrive at conceptual variables that can't be measured directly. I always point out that the, the way in which Aspen knows the difference between a sulfuric acid plant and a liquid air plant is the properties. And if you don't get the properties right, you don't get a plant that exists or could exist. So what's the structure for modeling? Well, if you have a purpose such as process design and operation, product formulation and behavior, you're gonna use models. And my concept of this is that you start with the fundamentals like the laws of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics are not like traffic laws, they're always true. And so that's what you wanna make sure you get right. Then, the tools are theory, experiment, and what I call micro simulation, which is, which is um, molecular simulation and quantum chemistry calculations. I just try to lump them together in a single word. And experiment is central. And then these are what lead to models. And so what I'd like to do is to describe some do some justification of this structure and then show a couple of examples of how uh, I've Im implemented it in my own work. So here are the bridges from fundamentals to modeling. Theory gu guides, but you get approximate results for idealized systems. Um, but it, what's good about it is it collects the variables in the, in the system into parameterizable ways so that you can do models based on parameters. Microsimulation augments. It's essentially exact molecular physics and chemistry, but you use approximate micro interactions and electronics. So there's approximations in there. But experiment is essential. It's our only direct measure of nature's behavior. Unfortunately, it leads only to empirical correlations. So given that, what we want to do is to use all three uh, in our work. Well, why should you do experiments? Well, let's go back in history. Speak or listen to the earth and it shall teach thee. This is what is in the Bible. To learn the secrets of nature, we must first observe said by Roger Bacon in the 13th century. Whatever our opinions, they do not alter or derange the laws of nature, as Michael Faraday said in the 19th century. Developing theories without data is like making bricks without clay, said the fictional thermona, uh, Sherlock Holmes in the 19th century. You can see a lot by observing, said the baseball player Yogi Berra. Mother nature cannot be fooled, said Richard Feynman in the 20th century. Theories come and theories go, but good data are forever, said John Prousnitz in the 20th century. So experiment and data treatment are hard work, but vital to establishing truths about nature. So we have to utilize experiment effectively. So what are some of the issues in experiment? Well, data are fallible. You have to maximize the truth by examining and validating all the data with organized and searching skepticism. And maybe less or maybe more than meets the eye. A good example is this article by Paul Mathias on a case study of developing accurate and reliable excess Gibbs energy correlations for industrial application. A recent paper uh, by uh, Alan Basileva at NIST in Boulder and 21 other of us co-authors is good reporting practice for thermophysical and thermochemical property measurements, which is in pure and applied chemistry. There's the recipe for what you should be doing if you're doing experiments and what you should look for <laughs> if you're using experiments. Jim Olson at Union Carbide said a number of years, a lot of patents came from outliers. An assumption is the mother of all screw ups, which is a Murphy's law corollary. So what has happened with data in history? Well, Lord Rayleigh discovered that Ar discovered argon. He was doing an experiment. He said he, at the density of nitrogen, as he measured it after absorption of oxygen from the air, turned out to be different 
from nitrogen via direct chemical form formation. It was suggested that there was more than oxygen and nitrogen in the air, and by Jove, there was argon. Galileo, back in 1600s, suggested the planet Neptune existed. Here's his drawing. And while he got the planet's slow motion nearly right, he ignored his own sketch and thought it was a star. So Neptune had to be discovered two centuries later. Michelson decided in advance that electrons came only in integer values on oil drops. That was the famous oil drop experiment. Many data, however, showed up with a third <clears throat> of values, and he threw those out because he didn't think they, they could be right. However, he probably lost the chance to discover quarks. So this is the idea of you know, even famous people don't necessarily examine the data well enough to arrive at what can be good. An experiment of historical significance. In 1589, after centuries of speculation in the church, Galileo did an experiment to prove that the mass and density of falling spheres made no perceptible difference in their velocity. So here's a cartoon of uh, Galileo leaning out of the leaning tower, dropping some stones. See, now, it turns out that many people have cited this and said, you know, you take the road less traveled to discoveries. However, some things say things did not turn out so well. And so the quote in the cartoon is, it shouldn't happen this way, I'll have to alter the data. But that's not really the solution. Uh, fake news is really fake, but truth is truth. So what about the other tools? Well, theory and simulation also have sim limitations. Simulation is very seductive, but like most things seductive, is not necessarily wholesome, as Hans Andersen, well-known theoretician and simulator said. Uh, someone said one time, it is not virtual reality, it's realistic virtuality. So what those photons coming off a screen um, may seem to be real, they may not have anything to do with anything. And so again, you have to be properly skeptical about them. What about theory? Well, here's a cartoon of two colleagues. One's doing a derivation and he in the middle says, then a miracle occurs. And the other one says, I think you need to be more explicit in this step. And Jackson Brown said, believe in miracles, but don't depend on them. So when used together, theory, experiment, and simulation can yield advances. And that's what we're interested in. So let's take one more advice from a master, and this is Michael Faraday, saying many advancements come as we study the facts and try to bring them into harmony with our own understanding. Thus, perhaps the key to success is to one, study the facts, and two, attempt to derive an understanding based on the understanding of others. In other words, and that last phrase means you read the, lead the, need to read the literature as well. So facts should be established by careful use of all our tools is what I assert. So now let me give you a couple of examples um, that I've used over the years. One is to use theory and data uh, to describe the properties of near critical systems. Now, we find water in both technology and in geology at high temperature and pressure near or above the critical temperature of 647 Kelvin and pressures of 22.1 megapascals. Now, usually these salt systems contain trace amounts of gases and salts. So if you're gonna do process and geometric, geochemical modeling, Properties such as density, enthalpy, and solubility must be predicted because behavior is complicated and measurements are really difficult. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things we have to recognize is that near critical properties are divergent. For example, at the critical of a solvent, number two, the compressibility diverges. This would be the isothermal compressibility, which is defined as the change in the density with respect to pressure and at the critical point, it goes to 
infinity. It also leads to divergence of infinitely dilute solute partial molar volume. The partial molar volume is defined as this particular derivative. And at the critical point, for a light solvent, it goes to plus infinity. For a heavy solute, it goes to minus infinity. And of course, if the partial molar volume is doing something extreme, it's going to affect the density of the solution. There are also a heat capacity divergence. The heat capacity difference between um, the real partial molar infinite dilution and the ideal gas goes both to plus infinity and minus infinity as you go past the critical point. Again, this means that the enthalpies and the energy effects, therefore, are going to be dramatically different than you might have thought. So let's go investigate some data, accurate volumetric data of partial molar volumes in water for different solutes. This is methane, which is light, and this is boric acid, which is heavy. And there are two pressures. These are wonderful data taken by um, Leo Hednovsky back nearly uh, 30 years ago at the University of, uh, in, in Czechoslovakia. And this is the partial molar volume as a function of water density. And you can see that at the critical, and critical pressure would be 22, at a pressure of 28, the partial molar volume goes up very dramatically. At 35, it doesn't go up so much. On the other end, the boric acid goes negative. And you can imagine that as the pressure approaches the critical, these data points will go up or very down. And this is where it is in the liquid, you see. So if you was, if you, and it's not different, much different from that in the vapor. So you're talking about huge effects of the partial, on the partial molar volume. So, what is now what do we get for near critical systems? Well, if you use critical point scaling theory, you get a very weakly divergent, what's called a Krzyzewski function. This is given the symbol A12, and it's the limit of the critical of the ratio of the partial molar volume and infinite dilution to the uh, isothermal compressibility and made dimensionless by RT. Now, the partial molar volume is in infinite dilution is either plus or minus infinity and the denominator is infinity. So what's infinity over infinity? Well, it turns out it's whatever it is. So one of the things we can do is we can go to statistical mechanics and a relation is that this Koshevsky function is equal to the, the integral of the molecular direct correlation function, which was uh, measure, measures how do molecules, uh, particles affect each other when they're up very close. So now if we take the data and transform it into um, the Krzyzewski function, we can see what it looks like. And these are the data as a function of water density. And these are uh, data that were published by uh, Bob Wood et al at Delaware. And we're now talking about a number of different solutes that were taken uh, the data and you can see what's amazing about them is two things. One is they all fall on similar lines. They're very simple. There's no critical point divergence in the property. And furthermore, these data are taken at many different temperatures. And so it's a function only of density. So now this was entirely surprising. Uh, there, there, there seems, there, you can rationalize it like most theory of behaviors, but it's not something one would have derived. Also, then you can use thermodynamics to get the Henry's constant for the solute in there. And it's really convenient because <clears throat> it's nothing but a density integral uh, over the isothermal of the Krzyzewski function. And you can then take another derivative to get the heat capacity difference. So from this single correlation that I'm showing you of the um, Krzyzewski function, we can get correlations of data, <clears throat> for example, of Henry's constants, here's the log of the Henry's constant, versus temperature at various pressures 
uh, and these are from various sources. And here's what the calculation is. And you can see that uh, it does an extremely good job when we're talking about hydrogen sulfide, and it works well for lots of other solutes. The heat capacity data, which are for carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia, show this. And you can see this is where the plus infinity minus infinity comes in, where the data are at constant pressure of 28 megapascals. These are all calculated again from this idea of the basic behavior of the Krzyzewski function. And um, this is where this came from simply manipulating the data in relationship to what the theory suggests. Now, example two is to use data and microsimulation to describe complex solutions. We need hydrogen for both its energy and its chemistry, chemical value. So how do you get it? You don't find hydrogen lying around the house. In fact, nature doesn't really like to make hydrogen. If you get hydrogen and oxygen together, uh, they're probably going to make water with a lot of release of energy. Now you can get it by using natural gas. And if you're in the US, we use it now around the world from fracking. But of course, now using natural gas generates carbon dioxide. So that's not so good. Electrolysis is green, but only now is electrolysis even coming close to becoming an economic when you can get electricity from solar and store it, say, in batteries. Before, between the, uh, before the time of fracking and now, there was the a concept of using thermochemical decomposition of water, where you use chemicals that combine selectively with hydrogen and oxygen, and then you regenerate them with energy from helium from a uh, nuclear reactor. So here's a system in which you get reactions and separations with chemicals that you put in uh, water and get out hydrogen. And the way the reactor was connected was by using hot helium gas, which was then recirculated to the reactor. One of the 300 possible processes for doing this thermochemical decomposition was called the sulfuriodine process. What it uses sulfuric acid to get out the oxygen and iodine via uh, hydrogen iodide to get out the hydrogen. So let's talk about now how you might do this because there's a the part of the process, the SI process, is to do a reactive separation of hydrogen iodide, just called the HIX. So you put in HI, I2, and water into a distillation column, and out comes hydrogen in the vapor and iodine and water in the liquid. And this was found to, be, to work. But what was surprising was that you had to put in a lot of iodine and a lot of water in order to get the VLE necessary for a distillation column and not get liquid liquid equilibrium in the distillation column. And the question is, why is that? Why can't you just put in HI and separate it into hydrogen and iodine? Well, let's look at the da data. It turns out it's, it's very complicated. Here's a binary pressure composition diagram for HI and water. You have a vapor phase, single phase at low pressures. You have a liquid phase at higher pressures and low compositions. And here's the VLE. So this is a liquid plus vapor phase like this is. But if the pressure gets high enough, you get liquid, you get two liquids. And that's really strange because this is a negative VLE azeotrope, and that's liquid liquid equilibria. And if you think about it, uh, why negative VLE azeotrope suggests that the molecules like each other, and liquid liquid equilibria indicates that they like themselves rather than each other. So this is a system where all you do is change the composition and you go from one extreme to the other. In, a turn, in the ternary, which involves HI, water, and iodine, you get two different regions of 
liquid-liquid equilibria. One doesn't have much HI and another one which has lots of HI. So again, what you've got is a region where there's a single phase, but you have on either side two phases, two two, two phase liquid assistance. So what, it, what are the interactions that cause these behaviors? Well, to go back to Faraday, you better understand this if you're gonna do proper reactive distillation design. So let's go back to our diagrams and realize that this is solvation, which is attraction of unlikes. And this is association, which is attraction of likes. And the same phenomena appears when you're in here in a ternary as well as in the binary. So how do you describe this? All right, well, let's, we looked at the data and interestingly enough, one of the, inter one of the most uh, revealing measurements that was made was made by Pickering back in 1898 where he measured the me melting temperature of uh, hydrogen iodide and water. And he gets this measurement of the solid liquid phase boundary that looks like this. So, and the minimum of course is what we would call a eutectic, but the maximum is what indicates that there's a compound. So this would be a compound that the stoichiometry, stoichiometry of this would indicate um, four hot waters with a hydrogen iodide and this is three. And so it says there seems to be some kind of association, so we call it solvation of water with hydrogen iodide that is, dem is demonstrated clearly in the melting. But we know that anything that exists at the solid liquid phase boundary will also persist into the liquid, even though you might not see it uh, explicitly. This is actually a phenomenon that is often seen in liquid metal mixtures. Um, uh, Chuck Eckert at, uh, at Georgia, Illinois and Georgia Tech had, had showed this. It's also something that you see in deep eutectic solvents. Now, above the melting temperature, the compound would be demonstrated as the solvation that we see. It can also include ions. For example, you can get iodide with a certain number of waters associated with, and of course you get H3 plus as a separation of, this would be HI with N plus one waters. So you would write the liquid speciation as HI plus four waters goes to this. And if you can get ionization, that means that things are going to be soluble. So let's check with quantum mechanical calculations. James Murphy, my PhD student at the time, did a series of single point optimizations using Gaussian 03 as a software and a basis set like this. Those who know quantum chemistry calculations will recognize what this means. Most other people like me would say, I don't know what this means, but I'm sure glad I got a smart PhD. This would be what the energy would look like. And what you do is clusters in a vacuum and in a dielectric and the clusters would be, here's an iodide, an iodine, molecule, uh, iodine atom, and here are three waters around them. And then you look at different conformations. For example, this would be one conformation and orientation of the oxygens or hydrogens on the water also turn out to be important. And when you did a whole series of configurations, it turned out that this was the lowest energy. This is the image of what the lowest energy looked like. Here's a table of what the energies of formation that come from the calculations and to, to lead the stability of these hydrates. So this is for N equal one. This is strong. This is stronger. This is more strong. And this is even stronger. And here's the strongest, but then it's, not, it's less strong. So um, you're turning out that, that um, for each of these, you're gonna get a, a, a configuration that she says the compounds should exist. 
Now, the strongest is really uncertain in this because the outer solvation shells are omitted in the calculation, but it's consistent with the assumption of I of, with three waters, not I minus with one. So this is the one that was selected and that's consistent again with what was observed in the data. We can also look at some IR absorption spectra. This is what you would get in the peak that would come from I3. And when the ratio of iodide to iodine is doubled, only the I3 minus peak actually doubles. This is where you have different ratios of the iodide to the iodine. And here's the other, other uh, compounds. Um, and you don't see them changing, but you do with the I3 minus. So it suggests that only I3 minus is the polyiodide in the solution. There isn't an I5 minus, for example. Okay, you can also check via calculations by using the stability of I3 hydrates. Here's for N3, and this would be uh, the lowest. I, and it shows I3 hydrates are not very stable anyhow because these numbers are small and positive. So um, we don't have anything but I3. So now here's another question. Uh, that sort of explains the binary. Now what happens in the ternary? Well, does I2 dehydrate uh, this in the ternary? If you put iodine in with this ion, does the dehydrate take the waters off? Well, again, we go back to the calculations and this is what you get as the configuration of this particular species. You put some iodine in and you do some calculations to see what could you get I3 minus and three waters? And the answer is, yeah, that really happens. There's a very strong uh, Gibbs energy difference uh, in this associated with this reaction. So that all then explains why it is we get in the ternary, the miscibility amongst the phases, where in the binaries, you don't. So here's the explanation for them and what the model would be. Speciation lowers the vapor pressure as you add HI until you run out of water for the reaction. And remember, uh, there's three or four waters that go along. So it uses up the water in a hurry. Then the pressure goes up because all you have going into the system at this point that exists is hydrogen iodide. So the vapor pressure goes up. And then finally, you get to the point where it's recognized HI and water don't like each other. And so they form immiscible liquids. And the same thing happens here you start out with unfavorable interactions, but the iodine reacting with what's in these uh, two phase boundaries leads to a miscibility. So the unfavorable binary interactions are overcome by ternary complexing. And an important side issue, by the way, is calorimetric measurements are very informative. For example, hydrogen iodide water dilution calorimetry leads, it gives us excess enthalpies. And they're usually you're gonna have the speciations described by an equilibrium constant. Um, and that's related to the enthalpy change. Well, it turns out that when we did some calculations, Aspen doesn't force this particular constraint. It allows inconsistent values. So in fact, here's the calculation it has this kink in it about the point, same point where the minimum in the azeotrope occurs. And in order to get the data right, you actually have to go into Aspen and do a manual override in order to get rid of this kink. Okay, so that's the other example of where I found this philosophy of trying to use all the tools turns out to, to be work. So contemporary research combines the tools. <clears throat> the way I <clears throat> look at it, excuse me. Theory suggests simulations and experiment. Simulation predicts responses to conditions and experiments validate the simulations. 
And then experiments and simulation augment the theory because the theory is not necessarily complete. And then extensions of the theory organize and codify models and then models experiment provides parameters for the models. So this would again be this, the strategy in order to be able to do it. You start with fundamentals and you look at theory and simulation and be sure to do experiments. And then models describe the structure and the behavior of the system adequately that you can go ahead and do the design functions that you're interested in. So what are some ideas that maximize experimental information? Remember, <clears throat> experiments can be the same, have the same problem that uh, simulation and theory can have. And so you have to make sure that you get the real information you need out of the experiment. So you need to consider the goal, especially if you're gonna be using it for modeling. If a model is already established, you just get just enough data to get parameter values. One could conceive of if you got a one parameter model, you need one piece of data, for example. That's probably not enough, but you don't need a hundred pieces of data. If you know the model form, but you're not sure about the range of conditions, then you should explore the data in the boundaries of the region of interest. Don't just take them in the middle. And if current models are inadequate and you need to develop a new form, then you need to do enough, get enough data to test different kinds of model set and their variations. If the model form is unknown and interactions are undetermined, well, then you gotta find the phenomena most important to a situation. You should do molecular measurements like spectra and calorimetry, and you also do micro simulations to reveal structural effects. And if the behavior would affect processing, take the simplest data first. For example, uh, does it make a difference whether you have an azeotrope? Well, uh, take a measurement to see if the system has an azeotrope. Don't measure a whole bunch of VLE that's not related to the azeotrope or where an azeotrope might appear. So data like boiling temperature, melting temperature, azeotrope, liquid, liquid, microstructure like micelles and so forth. These would be the data that you'd wanna take first. So the best models describe multiple properties over ranges of conditions. So you generally want macroscopic properties. So you connect them by thermodynamic relations, especially calorimetric, as I showed you in the dilute sol is solute case. Theories and simulation are microscopic. And so you connect those by statistical mechanics or by intuition, perhaps. Then you verify the proposed molecular interactions using spectroscopy and computational chemistry, and you allow for all possible effects. For example, uh, some people a number of years ago said, you shouldn't be using alkanol amines to capture CO2 by, by absorption. You should use ammonia because when you look, when you make a certain assumption about what's in the solution, ammonia is so much easier to regenerate there's much less energy associated with regenerating. However, if you look at the solution of ammonia with carbon dioxide, which makes ammonium bicarbonate, there's little bicarbonate in there. And it's mostly CO2, or CO3 minus minus with some carbamate. Well, the energy effects associated with regenerating a solution that has these as a species is not the same these is, is not is about the same as a, you would predict well by just assuming ammonia and CO2 and not bicarbonate because it's not there. So if you assume all is bicarbonate, you get the wrong regeneration energy. And this was again published by Matthias in 2009 that said, be careful with ammonia thinking that it's, you're gonna get an energy benefit in the absorption. So what's the summary? Well, property models are vital to computer-aided process engineering. The fundamentals are always true, must be bridged to models, which are sometimes true. The model formulation uses organization skills and strategies, experiment theory and micro simulation. And contemporary research and applications are complex, challenging, not error-free, people make mistakes there. In this business, there are many ways to go wrong. 
So the best effort, of course, is by using teams of people representing all contributions and fulfilling all rules. Most theoreticians are not good experimentalists. Uh, it takes a very special temperament to be a good experimentalist. And the other way around, experimentalists don't want to fuss with theories and so forth. So if you're gonna establish a team, you want one of each who will talk to each other and respect each other. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Professor O'Connell. So anyone who wants to ask a question can open the microphone or write down in the chat. Our YouTube viewers can write questions there too and we will read them here. So who wants to be the first one? We have 65 participants so far. Hi, Carol. Hey. Hi, Don. Um, I have a, a, a very, I, I didn't understand one thing on your slides. We had something okay. where you said something was strong, stronger, good, strong. I, and the, the numbers didn't go in an order. So I, I got lost on that slide. Sorry to be. Yeah, that, that's, that's a confusing slide. Uh, don't worry about that particular detail. We did okay. it right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I got it. Yep. I, I, I want to, to make a, a comment. Uh, sure. Well, we know that uh, data are very important and funda fundamental for or any decision that you have made. Uh, but sometimes uh, you don't publish what you, you observed. Uh, you publish something that you use a model, very simple model to translate what you observed and what you, your, your data that you are publishing. And sometimes I, 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 I think that the, the, the model is extremely simple to to make this translation, you know? Uh, what do you think about this? Early in my PhD work, I was looking at developing intermolecular potential models for water with nonpolar substances like argon, methane, and so forth. And I went to the data that have been taken at Caltech by Sage and Lacey for uh, water with uh, methane and lighter hydrocarbons. And when I went through of analyzing them to get the second cross virial coefficients, they, wouldn't they, they couldn't be described. And I could not figure out what the problem was until I went back to the original paper, not what was published, but the original data and found, oh, what they published was smoothing of those data. And in fact, the data weren't smooth at all. So uh, yes, you can really run into trouble with this. This is why the article that I mentioned that's in Pure and Applied Chemistry, it will be very important because it's, it tells you what you should be publishing um, and what you should not be publishing um, and therefore would give you the most reliable information. And if, there are plenty of ways in which, first off, the data is themselves can be uh, erroneous. But secondly, what's published can either be incomplete or in fact published wrongly. Uh, in NIST that we do with, pub, uh, with fluid phase equilibria and other journals have come, come together to have NIST evaluate experimental papers on experiments. And they came to doing this every time because fully a third of all published papers have errors in the data. Um, and of course, if you don't have, if you only have a graph, how do you use the data? Um, so that, you know, it's, you should at least publish the values, the measured values, and not the correlate, you can publish the correlated values, but you make sure to publish the measured values uh, someplace, of, at least in supplementary data. And, and thank you. Fact, if, if you encounter a system in which it's not published that way. Go pursue the authors and say, can I get your data? <laughs> uh -huh. 
but even very sophisticated data like uh, X-ray uh, uh, information or, or some, you, you, you always have some model in, uh, between what Absolutely. you observe it and what you are publishing, you know? Yes. Uh, and, and, and sometimes not clear uh, the assumption that uh, you, you, you have used to, to translate these uh, to information. Right. Although I, an example of that was when I was doing, we were doing simulations of surfactant micelles. And uh, the data, there were data that came out from uh, pulsed NMR that um, indicated that the uh, head group would see the aqueous solvent. And the question was, is that because the uh, head group was uh, going outside and encountering the solvent or because the solvent was going inside and encountering the head? And there wasn't any um, unambiguous way to answer that question, even though the data were there. And, it turned out that the data also were polished in order to arrive at that conclusion like you're, you're asking about. And so that was where we went, we started doing molecular simulations. This was 40 years ago. Jim Hale did, did the coding of it and we ran the Clemson mainframe weekends at a time in order to get a simple simulation, which now is done in a minute uh, on mm -hmm. supercomputers. Um, but uh, the point was that we made tried to make connections between this, what was simulated and what the measurements were, but the measurements only needed to give us the qualitative, not really the quantitative. And I think x-rays, for example, unless you're really interested in structure, detailed structure of what the molecules are like, uh, you don't necessarily need anything but trends with changes in conditions. Thank you. Professor Georgios, uh, oh, yeah. would you like to ask now? Yes, uh, John, uh, thank you. Thank you very much um, for the talk. Um, you emphasize again and again about the experimental data, how important they are, and um, it has been, they have to be combined with simulations, with modeling. You even mentioned at the end that experimentalists, of course, and uh, experts in modeling are not necessarily the same people. Um, I fully understand uh, those, uh, those statements. And um, I'm very concerned about the future of experimental measurements in thermodynamics. In a recent survey that we finished in, in yeah. Europe, in the, in the EFC, that will be published in IC Research, uh, the companies, um, companies express a huge concern about the closing of uh, laboratories. Probably they mean um, Europe and the US. Um, so what, what are your views? I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, I think you had so many statements about the importance of the data, but um, can it be that in 50 years we will stop measuring completely and everything will be just simulation and modeling? And um, uh, are there, how is the situation in the US right now in terms of the experimental measurements? Uh, because at least um, in Europe, the situation is that the experimental laboratories are closing one after the other. Well, we don't have any more to close in the United States. I see. I see. <laughs> okay. It's, um, yeah, it, I, I agree with you, Georgios. And this is something that I think having too much trust in the photons off the screen uh, is something that, that we have to be very careful about. And this is part of why I would advocate it, that having data is really important. Now, um, as long as people think they can get away without making measurements, as I mentioned, experimentalists have a very special temperament. Uh, you have to cultivate experimentalists if you really want to get good data from them. And, and they deserve it because they have a rough life. Um, um, but the idea that we should not have any measurements going on, of course, is foolishness. Um, and people are going to make many, many mistakes uh, because they don't realize how nature really behaves. And the only way you know how nature really behaves is by taking data. Do you think uh, we all we can do is continue to advocate. Um, and of course, we, we need to point out, it should be pointed out 
when there's a failure because the system is not well enough characterized because nobody's used data. Do you think we can, we, there is anything that can be done by the community to, to, to change this trend? Because the companies are really, really worried, as uh, you will see in this uh, survey. About well, the I, I mean, I think that one of the things that the community can think about doing is what I just mentioned, and that is find out. Companies are un, often unwilling to reveal when they have a failure. Mm. But <laughs> you might, when you're, when you're uh, at a party or having a drink, you might say, so have you ever encountered a situation in which you did a simulation based on no data and it's screwed up? And you get on you to admit that, yeah, this happens. And you say, so what do you do about that? And the answer is, well, you probably ought to make some measurements. But and I try to point out a strategy for making measurements, which depends upon what your goal with this is. And, and the, one of the experimentally should also be encouraged to uh, have apparatuses that can be used for multiple kinds of systems associated with their industry. Mm. Um, so that they can be used for many different cases. And in fact, Another problem, of course, is in big companies, they all have individual businesses and none of those individual businesses want to invest in anybody. Uh, and as a result, they won't go to a laboratory in another business and try to get something out of them. Mm. Uh, in fact, I, I tell a story of um, when we were doing the book, the first book with Prasen Secretary and O'Connell on comp computations of uh, vapor liquid equilibria. Um, we had Fleur in, uh, do some tests of our code, and I went down and gave a talk about what it was in our modeling and so forth. And there was a small group of people who were in the central research group at Fleur uh, there. So I went back, they were invited me back 25 years later to give a talk on what my research was then. And I could walk into the room and four of the five people in front of me were the same people that were there 25 years earlier. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and the only one who was different was the supervisor. So I said, so how are things different now 25 years? And this was in the 80s. And the supervisor says, there's been one major change. We uh, used to be uh, an investment and now we're a cost. And once you're considered a cost, you're vulnerable to be cut. And that's really what's happening, Giorgio, is that people don't realize that you need to invest in getting information that's valid and useful. Yes, thank you, John, thank you. Can I ask a question, Professor O'Connor? Sure. Previously, they used to publish books like Celebrity Data Series. A person like Bettino will collect all the data from all over the world, experimental data, and make a critical evaluation of it. And such data are very, very useful. And now I don't see that is being continued. What happened to that type of NSF efforts? Well, um, NIST. Uh, is continuing to do this, and they have a, a, a small group there that works on uh, developing, collect, uh, collecting the data as is published. <clears throat> as Georgia points out, there's not that many data that are appearing these days. And so uh, they're doing evaluations. So the <clears throat> Thermodynamics Research Center, I guess is the Thermochemical Research, TRC is what it's called. There you can get the data there. Um, you can't. You can't get. You can't get for free um, all of the data that they have, but it can be purchased. Uh, companies will do this, um, and they do a lot of evaluation of those data. Uh, and, and in fact, the group in the group is Alabasaleva that uh, wrote is this. Uh, lead author on this paper that I pointed out that's just coming at, come out in pure and applied chemistry. So NIST would be the center for this. I think DECIMA is still doing some of that. Is that right, Georgios? Uh, is is uh, DECIMA doing any data collection anymore? 
I'm not so sure, John, actually. I'm not so sure. I mean, they were doing, but uh, I'm not yeah. entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. I, I think probably they are. I haven't seen myself something very recently. Yeah. But, I, I think they but, are. I, I think okay. they are because they sell updates of the database. Then Marcelo yeah, knows better yeah. That's right. Um, but I, I think the, the emphasis is not as great uh, well, as it used to be. And part of it is because the, the amount of data that are being tabulated. And, um, and, and you know, with uh, pa papers that are putting out, uh, journals which are putting out papers with data in it, um, you can, if they're done right, you can go do it yourself. You can get data yourself. Now, you'd have to evaluate whether the data are any good uh, rather than have somebody else do it for you. That's where NIST comes in. Yeah, thank you, Professor Khan. Sure. Okay, now we have Professor Esvaldo and then Ma Professor Marcelo. Oh my goodness. My, my part uh, is just to great uh, Professor Khan and everyone here. And uh, I could follow uh, your talk. I have just a comment. It's concerning the liquid speciation. And I was very impressed that it can be used for the volumetric behavior description. You showed the partial molar volume uh, at infinite dilution, liquid liquid behavior, and also the azeotropic explanation. And then I wonder about Professor, it's a very uh, great pleasure to see you. I, I hope you recall me when we yes, were. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am in the other part of uh, in, uh, uh, of Brazil and northeast now and uh, in 90 I think it was in the years of 90 uh, professor were in Lindy where we we met each other it's Okay about, yeah right yeah it's uh, it's about 13 years ago <laughs> yeah, they, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I am we all look slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> we all look slightly different, exactly. Yeah, right. Nice to look you again. To nice to see you. Watch you your performance. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, I want to learn a little bit more. Uh, we, we, can, we of, of course know that uh, we can model uh, uh, and suppose that there are new species. And when we represent we have, as you showed, the binary diagram with only two species. And uh, I'm looking forward to learn more about this, this subject because it's very important to explain what we observe experimentally. I think this is, and, uh, and for me, it gave me in this talk, short talk we, we listened to you that we can uh, define another spe uh, uh, a specific sp uh, speciation to describe a system, for example, in a simulator, things like that. And I think this gives a uh, chemical engineering um, way of solve the problems that we, for example, an equation of state cannot do, but maybe doing another speciation will solve the problem in a, in a proper way. So it's just a comment. And again, thank you very much for your contribution again. It's a pleasure for me. Well, I, I guess I want to comment about that because if you look back in the early literature, uh, in fact, Prausnitz used to point out that, that in the early part of the 20th century, there were two competing theories about what fluids, particularly liquids were like. There was the Van der Waals, um, uh, theory, basically, where everything was physical. And then there was a Dolezalic theory, which everything was chemical, and that all you had to do was to get the speciation right. And the species were immutable. They, once you made them, they, they were there. And the conclusion, of course, is that most systems that have strong interactions have some of each. And the Saft equation of state is an example of utilizing the combination of physical and chemical. And, and so you, you don't want to get carried away with um, one extreme or the other. But of course, like usual, if things aren't black and white, 
they're gray, they're really, it's really a challenge. <laughs> and so that's why you get complicated equations of state and uh, you have equilibrium constants for speciations. Where experiment, particularly um, X-ray and, and other kinds of molecular measurements come in, is they can tell you what the species are. And once you know, once you've got the speciation right, then you can build a model. So if you've got a complex behavior, you look first to see, so is this behaving like there are species in there that I don't know about? And that's where the data that you're talking about modeling are important. And then you go make some measurements um, as well as do some simulation and theory to see uh, what is it that's gonna make be necessary to propose a really good model. Yes, I was wondering as well, for example, the size of the ion, because we have to consider the solvation sometimes, for example, and, and, and this can also be figured out probably when you, 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 you join as simulations and experimental work, spectroscopy and, and so Yeah, on. well, and of course, the, uh, in the case I showed you of iodide with water, that's a very strong uh, species, uh, strongly bonded. But regular ions, you know, strong electrolytes as we call them, don't necessarily have a uh, strong uh, hydration on it. An indication of that is in fact the partial molar volume and infinite dilution of a salt in water. And exactly. what you find is, yeah, it's, it's can it, it can be even negative. Um, although what's another thing that's interesting about that is that you know that you'd say, well, if I put an ion in and water latches onto it, the entropy of putting the eye in it, it should go down. Experimentally, when you put an ion into water, the entropy goes up. Mm -hmm. And you say, what's going on here? Well, the answer is the waters that are hydrating will have to let go of all the other waters and therefore they're not bonded. And so there's so many more waters that are loosened, the entropy goes up. Mm -hmm. Yes, it occupies the space instead of the water. Yeah. So, so you have to be careful about m trying to model them too, uh, too carefully about uh, species from hydrations and so forth because they're sort of floating rather than a strong and fixed. I understand. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Marcelo Gachet, please. Uh, thanks, John. Beautiful presentation. Also, I have Professor, I have known Professor Kono for so many oh, years, yeah. 85. We also <laughs> in Denmark. Met in Denmark. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. And uh, now, See, if George, you George, <laughs> Denmark's really important in the history of our system, and it's great that you're continuing it. Yeah. So if you pick up pa some papers from the 1930s, for example, you find uh, the, some experiments that were carried out in industrial plants to understand the vapor liquid behavior of a given mixture by can stopping the production and measuring uh, what happens to the distillation column uh, in a real plant. It's almost impossible to find a paper like this these oh, days. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. My, my reading is that it's not really necessary because our understanding of the fundamentals of phase equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, of transport properties, and how all of this comes together for, process, for equipment design makes these experiments unnecessary. Now, my question has to do with the following. So we, Georgios and yourself have commented on the decrease of, uh, of the number of groups closing uh, that are, we're doing a conventional uh, phase equilibrium measurements. Isn't it the case that what's going on is that as in the past, now the experiments that are necessary are different. So is it hopeless or do you think that, no, just we need different data now 
And so I would like to have your thoughts on that. And that's why you don't have vapor liquid equilibrium uh, labs opening these days because people need different data. Well, uh, I, I think what you're suggesting is that the kind of data which we uh, traditionally got, get in vapor liquid equilibrium is not enough to do a distillation column. There's so much more going on in a distillation column. Um, what has been interesting in, in discussing in AICHE about education uh, and research is in traditional chemical engineering disciplines, what, you know, refineries and chemical plants and so forth, is nobody does research, academic research, in uh, distillation anymore. Uh, and it's not because all the problems have been solved, but it's not sexy enough to get funding. Uh, and as, as a result, you, a young faculty member can't get any funding and can't get tenure by studying, quote, distillation, per se. And, and again, I think companies have been just like the idea that they don't need any more physical properties data. They think they don't need any process data in order to be able to do advances um, because they think they've got it all solved. And besides the costs, and <laughs> they want to cut costs. So I, again, I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be like uh, 20 years from now, uh, but I worry that a lot more mistakes are going to be made in process and design and development without adequate information. And I don't know what we do about this. I'll probably be dead and gone when things really get bad, but um, it's, it's something that, that um, future generations have to worry about. The other thing about distillation, of course, is what's the average age of a distillation column in a factory these days? It's really long because distillation, they run and they run and they run and you just clean them up every once in a while and they run some more. <laughs> and the, Chuck Eckert pointed out one time that if you go to the Exxon refinery in New Jersey, every distillation column had 30 plates. And the reason was because they were simple. To, you just made one after another, they're all the same. And if it was too much, well then, okay, you over-designed. If it was too little, you put another one in. Um, and that's, that's an industry's solution to those kinds of problems, which you can't afford to do anymore. Thank you. Nice. Uh, Professor O'Connor, can, yes. can you make some comments on biotechnology? There, the, all the people seem to be worried about only chemical theories, as you were pointing it out. How far the biophysics can get forward with thermodynamics ideas, say like a membrane separation, or they pointed out lipid membrane, or bilayer, or something like that? That's a great question. Um, as we know, biological systems are much messier than, uh, much more messy than, than any chemical system we know about. And, that's, and furthermore, there's so many more biological molecules that are around. You know, one of the questions I would ask my students when I started out the course in thermodynamics, I'd say, so how many substances do we know about? And they'd guess, oh, 10,000. 100,000, I say no. Uh, when I first started that question, it, it was around 40 million. Now it's 70 million because, and all of them are coming, you know, the new ones are coming out because of drug design and all those kinds of investigations. So, how do you deal with it? Well, um, in, uh, right now I'm involved in a project in where, for a clever uh, process for using waste wood and bio waste to generate hydrogen and carbon black simultaneously. And uh, my part of it is to do a simulation. Well, how do you characterize bio waste? <laughs> <laughs> well, in the literature, it turns out that there's several papers that tell you what you need to know in order to simulate processing cow dung, which would be a bio waste. And there are uh, others that uh, would tell you how to characterize 
uh, for simulation purposes, wood in order to do a pyrolysis, in order to get pyro pyrolysis gas. So there are people who are doing this in that business, but it's a literature that you would not normally get into if you're a chemical engineer. Um, I also did a few years ago, I was working with my colleague at Virginia, Eric Fernandez, and we were doing hydrophobic chromatography to separate proteins. Um, and it started out because he came to me in my office one day and says, so I'm an experimentalist and you're a modeler. And we really need to get together. And I said, oh, no, Eric. You're doing proteins. I, I studiously avoid anything that's polymeric. And he said, come on, get real. So we worked together for, in fact, about 10 years and published about 40 papers on, in this area. And I, but it was a literature that I had no clue about because I was raised in the Prasnitz fashion. And Prasnitz, of course, did it himself uh, because he was working with Harvey Blanche and others in that business. But uh, you have to go look at the, and there's a lot out there in literature, a lot, a lot of data which are not, very, I mean, papers which are not very well written, but there's a lot of measurements out there. Nice. So, thank you, uh, Professor Silva. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much, Professor John. Mm -hmm. Oh no, my camera, I cannot go. Oh, yes. Silvana, how are you? Fine. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting and challenging um, presentation. It's very good to see that experimentalist is not uh, dead. We, you, <laughs> I've been, I have been yet. from one side to other. This year I have to reinvent myself again because I cannot go back to the lab. Our labs are closed. For a year, I think next week we'll do a year that you cannot enter the lab. So it's very bad for experimentalists. I have to change all my students to know you are not experimentalist anymore. Now you have to do theory. Oh dear. Well, <laughs> yes, because point. we cannot I, do. Well, it's, it's, here it's, it's very very difficult. But one thing that I would like to comment is that the problem is that in some way the community also does not uh, value uh, data a lot. Uh, when you publish a data thing, it's not that important. O okay, now we'll have to have groups who do and mix uh, data and the theory. Right. But in, in, in some cases, you do not have theory. You have to have the data to begin the theory. I have been with a biotech components and also uh, ionic liquids. There are a lot of data, but there are some families that do not have any data. So we have to do the data. But sometimes when you publish it, people say, oh, it's not important. And then I think the community, including if you go to PPE, PPD, is almost everything simulation. So you know, I all, think yeah, if yeah, data are necessary, the community you. should value it again. Right. Well, I, talk, I don't know if anyone connected in is on the next PPE, PPD organizing committee. Um, one of the problems we, uh, I am the only person who's actually been at every single one of the conferences uh, starting in 1977. And I've been on the organizing committees since I chaired it in 1983. I keep trying to get off, but they say, no, O'Connell, your history. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, but one of the problems we have at a meeting like that is exper presenting experimental results is not very interesting. Um, and so it, it it's something that I think we need to do a, something about in order to what's the right forum to present experimental results in it. The other thing I would encourage an experimentalist to do is don't just pick, don't just pick some system that seems interesting to you. 
what you should be making measurements of are systems in which there seems to be some confusion or uncertainty in the literature about how the system is behaving. Or people that you know who are modelers saying, you know, I, I have this process and I don't just don't understand enough about what's going on in here to develop a model. So that the experimentalist, uh, it, you know, the chemists and so forth and a lot of the literature of the past was somebody said, oh, there's an interesting system, let me, let me make some measurements. And then they never, they don't necessarily have anything to do with anything because nobody's interested in them in the long run. Mm -hmm. but again, you have to, part of forming a team which is made up of a theoretician, an experimentalist, and a simulator, a molecular simulator, and a process simulator. I mean, I think it needs to be a four four person team at least. Is that they can talk to each other about their needs, and then they can provide what they need. And the experimentalist should be able to be prepared to go make measurements of the kind that would be related to what the team is going to be focusing on. You, I think it's time. Yeah? Okay, so thanks everyone for the discussion. Let us all thank again, Professor Connell for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John.